Hello and welcome to today's Business Skills webcast, Pricing, Getting It Right for Your Business. My name is Sarah Gonzalez and I'm from Redback Conferencing. Whether you're in finance, sales or marketing, pricing transcends all areas of the business. In this webcast, we'll be joined by Rachel White and she'll take us through the nuts and bolts of pricing. How are you today, Rachel? I'm really well, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for coming. So first of all, I think we should start off really high level and can you just enlighten us on why pricing is such a big deal? Look, Sarah, that's a really good question. Um, it's a question a lot of people have asked. Yep. Um, in your business, there's probably no decision that, imp that impacts your profitability more mm -hmm. than pricing. Um, there's no decision that impacts how your customers perceive you more than pricing. Mm -hmm. But let, let's start with the, the profitability question first. Yep. Uh, so we'll just walk you through an example of why that is. Um, so these are two different options. So on the top left-hand corner here, um, you sell a thousand units at a hundred dollars each. Just very simple maths. So that's revenue of a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Um, your direct costs. So these are your costs of delivering your product, um, whether that be making it, whether that be customer support, wh whatever your product is yep. or service is. Uh, your overheads are the cost of uh, running a business. So that's your rent and your office and um, paying yourself, which is fairly important, really, as a as a business owner. Um, and that leaves a profit at the end. Now, these ratios are fairly normal mm -hmm. to have a 20% profit, 30% um, direct costs and 50% overheads. That's, that's pretty normal. Yep. Um, let's look at the second option where we've actually increased prices by 30%. So mm. all we've changed is that prices have gone up from $100 to 130 um, in terms of the costs, uh, the direct costs have gone up. Why is that? The product's more valuable. Mm -hmm. um, when you deliver something more valuable, generally speaking, it costs you more to deliver that. Um, it's more premium product, better service, better branding, whatever it happens to be. Uh, the overheads generally stay about the same. Uh, so if you look at the arrows there, um, you can see that with a 30% price increase, the profit percentage has gone from 20% to 32%. So with a 30% price increase, we've had a 50% uplift in profit percentage rate. And the actual dollar value itself has gone from 20000 to forty one, so it's doubled. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see there how a uh, price increase there of 30% basically doubles your profit down the bottom. On the other side of it, and we'll get to this later, uh, around discounting in particular, uh, you can see how discounting would actually have the absolute opposite effect to that. All I'm thinking right now is electricity and energy bills oh. in my head. Yes, I think indeed. that's what everyone talks about. You think, you know, a small little increase and the yeah. impact that that can have. I think all of a sudden when you put it down and you actually see the numbers, it's wow, almost. Um, but one thing you did mention there just mm -hmm. um, slightly was value. So I just want to talk about um, the discussion around value. So what's the connection between valuing yourself and how others value you? And what does that have to do with pricing? Yeah, Sarah, that's a, that's a really good question mm. again. Um, the focus for today's webinar is very much on service providers. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're a service provider, uh, the, the product you're selling is effectively your knowledge. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's you, yourself. Um, whether that be a solopreneur out there, if you're running your own business or if you're, a, if you're working uh, for, a, for an SME, um, if you're in the services area, it's, it's all about the people. Yep. Um, and so mindset matters. Yeah. Um, Pricing absolutely sends a message mm. um, on how much you value your product yep. and your service offering to the market, which in some respects talks about how much you value yourself. Mm. Um, and that absolutely comes through. It, it's almost like um, the non-verbal body language that's 90% of communication. Mm. Pricing pricing's kind of like that. All the signals it sends to the market absolutely talks to how much you value yourself. Mm. Um, and so therefore how much you value uh, your relationship with your clients and hence how much your clients will value you. It's a, it's a circle. Mm. The psychologists can probably talk about this better than I can, yep. but it is a pattern I've definitely observed over the years. So let's look at some of the difference in the language. So on the left-hand side, we have language that's used for premium products and mm -hmm. for, for very valuable services. Exclusive offer, loyalty bonus, rewards, lifetime membership. It's all about building a, a relationship a mm. a, a, on, on the basis of trust, um, long term over time. Uh, whereas on the right, um, free, um, bargain, on sale and never to be repeated. Mm. Um, it's very transactional. It's very almost adversarial in some mm. respects. Um, there's a lot written on, I saw something the other day about the dark side of free. Yeah. Um, we'll get to that later on in terms of what that means, um, where free sits um, in the value chain. 
Um, but it, it's just to show you an example of the difference in language. Now, in retail, and especially mm. in the moment in bricks and mortar retail, I think everyone's been on sale for the last four years. Yeah. Um, you know, so it doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah. The price has been reset. That, yeah. That's just the way it is. Um, versus someone like Apple who set up an Apple store. Mm. Um, and that's a marketing thing for them. And to also teach people how to use their products. It's actually not about sales. Yeah. The irony, of course, is with all the accessories they sell in there, they make money hand over fist in those stores. Mm -hmm. But that was never their intention with them. Um, so they had a very different intent with that bricks and mortar retail. And it was all about the fact they value their customers and mm -hmm. their customers' experience with their product. Versus the traditional bricks and mortar um, model where you have stock in the store and you buy it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Yep. Um, and the experience. Um, I know I shop a lot, and the experience is not spectacular. Mm. So you know, it's not something I feel any particularly loyal to yep. to any particular shop because the actual experience itself is is mm. well, you know, subpar really. Um, yeah, so it's just to illustrate some of the words that you'll have seen in the market um, and the difference in how your clients will feel. Yep. based on when they see those words. And I think this is something that we experience in everyday life, yeah. especially as consumers with the retail stores that mm. we like. And it's all starting to um, sort of make sense in my head now with the brands that you like and you know, whereas if something does come across as free, it's almost a little bit dirty and it's like, yeah, oh, it's where's like, the mm. catch? Yeah, there's yeah. something going on there. <laughs> so I guess that talks a lot to messaging then. So yeah. um, what does this mean in terms of messaging? How can we sort of incorporate this in terms of what we do um, in everyday life? Um, yeah, so you'll see there in this in this slide, messaging sitting in the middle yep. on both sides, um, and messaging is probably the most important part of pricing. Mm -hmm. um, the point of of these flows is on the one on the left, um, being financial messaging and mindset is that's actually how pricing is often done today. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people. I've seen it was also written the other day. You have to go talk to your CFO about pricing, and that's all a bit all a bit scary. Yeah, you know, yeah. We CFOs <laughs> apparently are a little bit scary, um, but it is because it because of the impact it has to the bottom line. That's generally why it sits in the finance function. Mm. Um, but it does start with a finance focus, and then you eventually get to messaging and mindset. It's a poor third if you ever get to it. Mm. Um, mindset is all about that: how you value yourself and the value that's inherent in your brand. Yeah. Um, my philosophy is to actually turn it around the other way. We start with mindset, we then look at messaging, and I partner with a lot of marketing people on this. Mm. And what I tend to find is the finance result that spits out the bottom um, is actually a lot healthier. Mm. Um, and so it's, it is still very much with profitability front and centre, um, but I tend to find turning it around actually improves the result. So if we do turn it around then, um, obviously that's your advice, what's an example of how this would actually work and why doesn't the first approach actually work? Yeah, Sarah, that's a really good question because I appreciate that's a really big call. Yeah. Um, so let's have a look at an industry I think we've all seen a lot of, and especially in the last oh, yes. year or so, is the media business. Mm. Now, the media business has been having a bit of a meltdown for around, oh, 10, 15 years now. It just keeps going, doesn't it? Uh, just, it just keeps rolling right along. <laughs> the never-ending gift. Oh, yeah, it keeps on giving. But um, And I do feel for people in the media business because their business model is being eaten alive. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you think of the transition from print to digital media... Yeah. Um, when they looked at it from a pricing viewpoint, um, a newspaper had a face value of $2, uh, for example. I'm, I don't even yep. remember. It's yeah, been so yeah. long since I bought a newspaper. Um, and then digital media had no printing costs. And yep. so the assumption was, oh, okay, we can just get rid of the face value because we've got no cost of delivery. Um, so we moved from a token price of $2 to zero. Now, in print media... Um, the bulk of their revenue did not come from the face value of that $2 you spent to buy the paper. It was from advertising. Mm. Um, and that was what paid for the uh, creation of the content. Mm -hmm. And obviously everyone's heard an awful lot about um, the difference between quality journalism and fake news in the last mm -hmm. 12 months, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so in this model, how do you deal with the cost of creating the content? So given we've started from a financial viewpoint, i.e., oh, yeah, the cost of delivery has mm -hmm. gone down so we can just drop our price to effectively free... Yeah. Um, the messaging that sends to the world is the value of that content is diminishing. Yeah. Um, and so if we just, just go back just uh, yep. a moment, from a mindset viewpoint, um, the message that the media business has now sent to the world mm. is that the value of what we create, the content, is actually not that high. Mm. I don't think it's a coincidence 
that the whole fake news thing started to rear its ugly head about eight months ago. Um, and obviously I'm not going to get into politics mm. today. Each side is accusing the other side of fake news. This is fairly yeah. rampant. Um, but I think from a, a business viewpoint, that's not a coincidence. Mm. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from how the media industry has got it wrong. Mm. Um, and they're desperately trying to put paywalls up now and, and various things. Um, I've even heard stories of journalists suggesting that media should be a, a government-run organisation, which just terrifies me, because mm. uh, that's not the answer either. Mm. Um, but if we can look at an industry that's just got it horribly wrong um, mm. as business owners um, and people who are charged with making pricing decisions, I think we can definitely learn a lot from that experience. Mm. Um, so this once again comes back to flipping it around. Mm. So, yeah, so how, how do we yeah. do this? It's, it's, it's all very easy for me to sit here <laughs> yeah, and say exactly, this. Yeah, exactly, yeah. How, how would you have done it? How, how, how would have I done yeah. it? Um, look, that's a really good question. And so let's, let's get into that now because this sort of gets into the real nuts and bolts of how to approach pricing. Um, so let's, let's talk about some of the mindset stuff mm -hmm. first. So there's a couple of quotes I've got here yep. um, that, yeah, uh, that I've just noticed observationally over mm. 25 years of doing this. And the first is that if someone doesn't pay for it, they don't value it. Mm -hmm. Whether that's um, content in terms of the news, um, whether that's um, strategic advice for a not-for-profit, the number of people I know who work for not-for-profits and the frustration they feel that they're not listened to. Mm. And it's just like, oh, how much did you charge them for that advice? Oh, I did it for free. Yeah. Uh, so I actually encourage people to charge not-for-profits, mm. yeah. um, not because of the money side of it. Um, obviously, their heart's in the right place and they want to help this organisation, mm. um, but because to make sure that um, there's actually being, uh, there is a value exchange, mm. you know, from that viewpoint. So I know personally in my model, I don't do free. Yeah. I do mentoring yep. for a lot of the accelerator programs around, um, in the in the early stage startup space, um, mm. and for me, that's that's actually part of the marketing value mm. chain for my brand and my business. Um, so that's how I view it. Mm. Um, so yes, yeah, so I don't get paid for it, um, but that's and we'll get to what that means from a free context later. Mm. But in terms of the engagements I do, I, I just I just don't do free. And I think that's like you said, a lot to do with the messaging, the yeah. whole mentoring, like thinking of ways that you mm. can actually give value, but not actually say, "Oh, I do free consulting." Yeah. I'm actually mentoring someone. Um, so, what about the link between customers and users? What you've got here? How does this all play into it? Because I don't think a lot of people would actually realise this or think on this topic. Yeah, and I saw Alan Kohler do something on Twitter once where he referred to Twitter's 300 million customers. Um, it was like, "You are a very smart man." And if you don't get this, then no yeah. one gets this. Yeah. Um, so if you think of Twitter is always the example of they that was used a couple of years ago in this. So I have a Twitter account. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have a Twitter account. Probably most people watching this have a Twitter account. We are users of Twitter. Mm. We are not customers because we don't pay them. Yeah. Twitter's customers are people who pay them money, which is actually the advertisers. Mm. Um, so I am no more a customer of Twitter than I am a customer of Channel 7 mm. um, in that um, I watch you know, a certain TV shows on Channel 7 because I enjoy watching them and I put up with the ads because I'm old school and haven't gone yeah. to Netflix yet. Um, I'll get there one day. Yeah. But, um, and yeah, Channel 7's advertising revenue is, is well, actually not just Channel 7, all of them. Uh, but they've got a problem. Um, and this absolutely gets to the value chain. Mm. Um, but yeah, and the... The other example I've seen is Google. Yep. Um, with you, if you might have a Gmail account, yep. which is free. Yeah. You're not a customer of Google. Mm. They're basically, you've given them your data that mm. they can use to create products for advertisers yep. in particular um, and also in, in other areas as well. So basically you've, you've effectively, the stuff you talk about mm. on your email address, they mine it. Uh, yeah. they, they have these huge algorithms that do it. There's no one personally sitting there reading your emails. Mm. Um, but that's why they do it. Um, yep. That's why it's, it's free. There is no such thing as free. Mm. Uh, so you are not a customer of Google in that regard. You are not a customer of Twitter. You're not a customer of Facebook. You're, You're a user. user. Um, and that completely changes the dynamic. So what's the benefit for um, an organisation or someone who runs a business mm -hmm. of actually sitting back and understanding this and using the right language? What's the benefit for them? Yeah, and I think that gets into um, your strategy, and especially in the early stages yeah. of your business when you're trying to become, get your brand name known because mm. that's, that's, that's when you're most vulnerable on yeah. this. Um, you don't have a known brand name yeah. yet. Um, you don't have that trust with, with your market. Mm. Um, and I think that is, uh, that's where in your product development area um, 
you absolutely do need to start building up that trust with the yep. market. And so it could be that you need to have a bunch of people use your product for nothing and then give you testimonials and then on your website. And then get customers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it, the, the purpose of them using your product to give you a testimonial mm. is to help you then bring, and especially in the digital world, yep. is to build up trust yep. um, to then allow you to reach your market and mm. paying customers. Yep. And so you've almost, those people, are, uh, they're not your customers. They're helping you build your product mm. um, versus those people who pay you money, they're customers. It does sound simple, but... Um, <laughs> It's where it gets complex yeah. is I'm talking about some very general principles. Yeah. We've then got a for you individually, mm. um, and obviously I'm CFO of Redback, yeah. so I do this with, with Redback, yeah. but where we actually drill into your business because mm. uh, the, the answers to this for any business are unique to that business model because mm. um, it's unique to the people who are in that company, yep. um, and that's where it gets complex. Because I can't give you an answer that's a one-size-fits-all. And yeah. uh, for all the people watching this webinar, um, the answer would actually differ yeah. uh, depending on who I'm talking to. Um, so the messaging, yeah. just talking about this, the fact that it needs to be easy to understand, easy to work with, valuable. We've pretty much spoken about that. Mm. And I think, you know, even the example that you gave using the word mentoring, um, would you suggest that people sort of take a step back and understand what they want to achieve and then different ways of using words and messaging yeah. to sort of get that out there? Because sometimes you want to give stuff away for free, right? Mm -hmm. But you just need to have a different sort of tack. Oh, yeah, in terms of how you present yeah, it to the yeah, market. Yeah. And the purpose free actually serves in your business. Um, I think the, you talked about mentoring. Mm. Um, I actually find mentoring by far the best way of getting those very, in advance of in artificial intelligence, yeah. the robots that will yeah. be able to figure all this out. For now, whilst we're still in the world of human beings, yeah. um, wrapping yourself uh, in a circle of mentors mm. is absolutely your best bet. Mm. Uh, so people who know your industry. Um, the other thing is it takes out the, um, if you hire consultants, um, and I am a consultant, so I'm, yep. I'm going to, you know, yep. sabotage my own pricing here, but there is, there's a lot of work that goes into making sure that you can demonstrate trust. And I know a lot of what I do mm. um, in my model is actually talk about when you are not going to need me anymore. Mm. Uh, I have one client at the moment where I was meeting them yesterday and I was thinking, yeah, at the end of the month, they're not going to you know, need me for a while. Um, and so I need to put that forward yep. and just say that's where you're at. And that's, you know, so it's part of building up that trust. The thing with mentors is there's less of that. Um, and so you can do a bit more quid pro quo. Mm. Um, the other thing is because they're in your industry, they can actually ferret down into the specifics of your business mm. model a lot more effectively. And you can do the same for them. Yeah. Uh, so I was doing some reading yesterday about, uh, for web developers, for example, there's a couple of online groups out there for web developers which are uh, talk about the mentorship programs they mm -hmm. have specifically for web developers because yep. web developers have a very unique set of challenges um, compared to acupuncturists, mm. for example, um, or compared to... Uh, people who are working in associations yep. um, and so it is just surrounding yourself with three or four people who just know your industry backwards mm. uh, and can give you guidance but also always knowing that the decision is ultimately yours. You know, and you just um, you touched on the sectors and then a few moments ago you also spoke about the not one size fits all mm. and I think it's oh actually yeah that's right so sometimes you do have to get into the nitty-gritty and the nuts and bolts of it so when it does come to sectors what does this work for and are there any other sectors where this approach might not apply to someone? Yeah, so I think for uh, for anything services related, yep. it absolutely applies because yep. the value of what you're selling is what you know. Mm. And so why can you be relied on? Why are you an expert? Yep. Um, and so that value and trust and all the rest of it is absolutely inherent. Um, and I think the banks in particular, mm. given it is a services-based business, um, I don't know all the details of the departure of the uh, CEO of CBA yet. Mm -hmm. um, the rumour mill is, is alive and well. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, clearly there's there's a definite suggestion of a breach of trust there, mm. um, which and all the banks have it. I'm not picking on CBA. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I think in the service provider model, um, it is absolutely holds true. Where it may not be the case is, uh, for example, as I said, I haven't quite gone to Netflix yet. I actually still rent DVDs. Yeah. Um, you know those green Hoyts kiosks which are in yeah, the supermarkets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're brilliant. Yeah. And the reason that works so well for... Do you have to talk to someone? Pretty much. <laughs> it's just like, I no, press three buttons. No, talk. Well, it's just, I, I'm looking for functionality and yeah. utility. I want a video. Yeah. That's it. 
Um, and obviously um, those kiosks don't have all the overheads of a shop. Mm. You know, so Blockbuster could never have done that because it, they just would have cannibalised their mm. own business model. Okay, so on that quickly then, mm. you know how sometimes they do, um, you know, buy three movies or buy two movies and get one for free. What do you think of that model? Yeah, and for them, it's a, for their pricing is, and profitability is a volume yep. thing. Yep. So, so if it is high volume, then... It's the classic, those videos are making them no money while they're sitting inside the machine. Mm. So the cost of actually producing the video is next to nothing. It's, yep. if, I mean, it costs $3 to rent it. I'm going to take a, call, a guess. It probably costs about $2 to produce it. Mm. So every time they only have to rent it out once and they've broken even, yep. um, I think. I don't know the model yep. specifically, but that's what I'd assume it is. Um, every time it gets rent out, there's a royalty stream that goes to the actual movie producers mm -hmm. um, and obviously they have a whole distribution model behind them around the IP. But the thing is, Hoyts makes no money mm. whilst those, those, those DVDs are sitting inside the machine. Yeah. So they're, they're looking to create volume and turnover. Mm. Um, but yeah, the, th the reason that works so well for Hoyts is because they're not doing anything to destroy their brand. Mm. Everyone's talked about the demise of cinemas for 30 mm. years. They're still there. Mm. I know I go to the cinema to hang out with my friends and get the big, the huge big screen experience and especially 3D mm. and I saw Avatar 3D and it was, like, those six legged dogs were actually walking <laughs> yeah. through us, you know, I mean, that was just, that was just amazing. You, that, yeah. That's not something yeah. um, that I'd even want to do at home, to be honest. Um, so I think Hoyts have, have figured out that their value mm. is actually the experience, it's got nothing to do with the product. Yeah. And so they could actually... Um, create those little kiosk things without in any way cannibalising their product, mm. their value. Um, but for them, it's a commoditised product. Yep. Um, and so, you know, three for the price of one, um, et cetera, et cetera, Works starts well. actually making sense mm. um, because it's, for them, it's also, it's an end of life product. Eventually, yeah. it will all go 100% digital. Like in 10 years' time, those kiosks won't exist. Mm. For them, this is it's known as a cash cow. Um, and that's what it serves in their business model, mm. and that's fine. I think that's so interesting when you think about it. You've got, Pete, the same industry, mm. the same sector, movies, and they've got the same, the whole idea is for people to watch the movies and enjoy, but you've got two totally different pricing models, two yeah. totally different experiences, and I mm. think we can probably learn a lot from that in yeah. terms of looking at our competitors as mm -hmm. well and trying to do things differently, and that's where this comes into it. Now, I want to meet Stella. Yes, please. Heard please a lot about Stella. Stella. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about Stella. What's she doing right? What's she doing wrong? Um, hi, Stella. Oh, yes, please, <laughs> please allow me to introduce Stella. Stella is, Stella is uh, one of the characters I use as a, as a teaching tool. Yeah. Um, so she's 40, 42. She's been in business for eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, she is a uh, web developer. Yep. Uh, so she's created her own web design agency um, eight years ago. She used to work for someone else for a long time yep. in her I guess mid thirties, she she jumped ship and built her own business, and that's not very unusual. familiar. Very familiar indeed, and yes, so Stella Web Design is yes. is the name of her business. Yes. Um, so Stella, like everyone else, um, had a lot of pricing challenges in mm -hmm. the beginning, and it's something that she still works through now. Um, mm -hmm. So she used to. Uh, so we're going to go through Stella's experience just yep. as a case study, um, yep. just to sort of see some of the the, the thing, the, the, especially around the messaging. What yep. what what messages her prices communicate to her mm, customers. Yep. Now, by the way, the messages in here are the same messages that accountants and lawyers are struggling with mm. in their pricing in terms of how and they're, they're so entrenched in the per hour model um, yep. that whereas Stella, it was a lot easier to shift. Yep. Um, so we're just going to walk through this for, for her. Um, so what she used to do is she would price each job um, and the job was to, to design and build and roll out a website mm -hmm. for a business. Uh, so she'd price each one individually. She'd scope it out. She'd figure out how many hours she thought it was going to take. Mm -hmm. She had a per hour rate that she used. Um, and she'd create a fixed price quote to give the customer certainty, but with a very specific scope. Yep. Now, the problem with that, of course, is the customer had no idea what was in scope and what wasn't, <laughs> and this is a 20-page proposal document. Yeah, yeah. And to get into the minutiae of that, you know that whole trust thing mm. we were talking about before? Just uh, So accountants and lawyers and all the rest of it have exactly the same People problem. don't really look at it and they're like, what is this? It's well, like a different language. Yeah. yeah. It, it's talking Martian. It's yeah. just like, I just want a website. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just build me a website and just, give me an invoice. make it work. <laughs> Um, and so because of that, every time the scope changed, she'd yeah. have to change the pricing. And so, of course, she's then got to go back and talk to the customer about that, mm. which is another opportunity to create distrust, um, and especially when it's an uncomfortable... Com you're starting from the point that you mm. feel uncomfortable because you should have known this. Yeah. Um, and I know you recently did something on the imposter syndrome, yeah. and so that's all alive and well in this process. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's almost set up to, to, to create issues. So from a messaging viewpoint, her, uh, Stella's pricing in the past... 
Um, she did. It did protect her from scope mm -hmm. creep. And scope creep in, in the service provider model is is a real problem. Um, it was easy for her to calculate because she did know the number of hours and times by an hourly rate. And so from her viewpoint, it's actually really That's simple. It's not that hard. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to associate with her cost, um, and everyone did it that way. Mm. So, you know, those were the benefits. So it at least looked familiar to the market. The downsides, um, she couldn't, there was no way she could advertise her prices on a website. An hourly rate on a website is not mm. helpful. It's like, well, how many hours is this going to take? I have no idea. Um, so most people don't put it on yeah. there when, when that's their model. Um, you couldn't, she couldn't answer pricing questions in the first meeting because then the whole it depends comes up. And if there's mm. two words that you should not use in pricing, it depends, is, uh, are, are up there. I'm going to write that down as one of my key takeaways. <laughs> never, ever use it depends. Um, I do my absolute damnedest. I'm in the finance profession and it's, it's rife. But um, I do my damnedest to avoid those two words. Yeah. Um, because it's just, again, the uncertainty and distrust. It's like, I know something you don't. Yeah, um, depends on what. <laughs> yeah, precisely. And it's just like, and I'm now going to have to swim my way through the quagmire to figure this out. Yeah. Yeah, so there are two words I just avoid if I possibly can. Um, it, oh, so because you can't answer the pricing questions in the first meeting, mm -hmm. you've got a lengthened sales process. You as a marketer would not completely mm -hmm. understand why that's a problem. Um, and so your customers are confused. Mm. Um, and again, all of that um, doesn't help you... Uh, promote those messages of valuable and easy to work with and simple to understand. Mm. Um, and also that your customer is value, valuable because the fact they don't understand what you understand doesn't make them stupid. Yep. Yep. And your customer has the imposter syndrome too. Yeah. So, you know. so everyone's just stuck. <laughs> We're all just stuck yeah. um, in, this, in this quoting per hour yep. business. So where, do we, where to next? Um, so what Stella did, um, so what she did was, and there's four p P's of marketing, um, as you know, pricing is one of them, packaging is another. And so what she did, and a lot of web developers are doing this, um, so you can either have a small, medium and large package, you can have in support, you can have uh, bronze, silver and gold, the tech industry's yep. been using that for years. Um, there is a general view that you have three, mm -hmm. um, and there's some psychology behind that. Um, most people tend to go to the middle one, so you want to make sure your middle one really is yeah. a something you can make profitable with good systems because uh, most people will gravitate yep. to the middle one. Um, and so basically uh, for a small website, um, it was $5,000. Yep. Uh, for a, for a medium, mid-sized one, it's 10 and large. And now this is where... This is where the work really comes in because then how do you... This looks like just two or three sort of levers mm. um, in terms of the number of pages, uh, the functionality. Do you have a shopping cart? Do you have a membership site? Um, it looks simple. This is actually the really, really tough stuff and mm. this is where having mentors in your industry is really, really helpful. How do you break it down? Because if, if you have more than two or three triggers, levers for your customer, you'll lose them. Mm. So you need to keep... Too much choice, right? Yeah, mm. yeah, too much choice. So what was it um, Steve Jobs and many other people have said is um, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Um, well, it works for Audi. Well, <laughs> indeed. Um, yeah, getting it down to a short list where the customer feels like they have options and they have control over which choice is right for them mm. without feeling overwhelmed yeah. is really hard. Um, and so there are companies, and especially in the uh, tech space, yeah. um, pricing is something that's just a constant iteration thing. And it is all about how do we bring it down to something simple, mm. something that's very straightforward and easy to understand. I think one of the reasons the Uber model was so powerful was because you already, I mean, I, I bought, uh, used a taxi to get here this morning. Um, from an Uber viewpoint, it's slightly cheaper. It's something I was already doing anyway. Mm. I understand the model. Yeah. Um, and so they made the experience better because you don't have to pay for it at the end of the cab journey. Mm. Um, and you can track your cab and all, all the other all features. All the other stuff. Um, but the, from a pricing viewpoint, they actually didn't disrupt the pricing model in many respects. Mm. They dis disrupted the, the, your, your interaction with mm. how the money moves in payments. The actual pricing itself is fairly similar mm. in many respects to, to, the, to um, order, booking a cab. Um, obviously just cheaper. Yeah. Um, and so they actually didn't disrupt. That, the one thing they didn't disrupt was pricing mm. in some respects. They did because yeah. it was cheaper, but it was actually all the other stuff. And then they got everyone used to them and they did the surge pricing. <laughs> yeah, well, especially what New Year's Eve is, $400 yeah. to get an Uber, which yeah. supply and demand makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You know. yeah. uh, it's like Uber, walk. Yeah. <laughs> Those tend to be your options. Um, the other one, and especially in services models, and I think this is really important, is 
where you, you, you don't want to turn down those larger, more mm. complex projects because they can be, it's where you learn a lot as yep. well. Um, they can be extraordinarily valuable and they're the, the you know, the ship coming in type things. Um, and so you don't want to cut those out. Mm. So what I usually recommend to service providers is you actually just have an option on the website, which is you want more than this. Mm. Um, let's talk about it and pricing available on request. And for people who want to spend more than your large package, that's that they expect that. And that's the exclusivity bit as yeah. well, isn't it, for those people? Because Absolutely. all of a sudden they feel, OK, I want more, I need more, I'm willing yeah. to pay more to be... Well, more exclusive customer. This actually helps start communicating the value mm. as well because it's like, oh yeah, I need more than a shopping cart and a membership site. Yep. For example. So, um, so the, the one thing though I'm struggling with with Stella, mm -hmm. this seems like a very one off thing with her. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had discussions with you in the past and I think for most businesses there's this, you know, holy grail of how do we get recurring revenue and how oh, do we yeah. make sure that this <laughs> money's constantly coming in so it's mm. not, okay, thanks, I've done your job, now see you later. So what is recurring revenue for people out there who don't understand it and why is that a good idea and how can someone like Stella incorporate this or how did she incorporate this? Well, let's talk about some of the bigger picture stuff of mm. other companies. Apple yep. struggled yep. with this. Um, so one of the reasons the iPod was so revolutionary for them, mm. I don't know the tech was that particularly profound. Or it may be, it may or wasn't. Um, it was the whole iTunes thing. Yep. Uh, because that became recurring revenue for them. Mm. Um, so all of it, they, they moved from a product sales business mm -hmm. to iTunes to... Yep. to um, uh, music downloads and that sort of stuff. Yep. I know personally I now have my music synced on three devices and mm. I pay $30 a year for that or something. Yeah. iCloud or whatever it is. And you don't even notice it. No. Yeah. And for them, obviously, there's probably several hundred million people around the world doing yeah. that. So for them, that is gold. Um, and for them, that creates predictable revenue mm -hmm. so they can plan their business. They can actually experiment with those big shop fronts they did because yeah. they would have lost money hand over fist on those yeah. to start with. So it gave them capacity to actually experiment with different ways of doing things. And that, that's what it does. It gives you certainty mm. so you can adapt your business model because uh, yep. you're not worrying about having to keep the pipe full all the time mm. so you can pay the bills next month. Yeah. Um, to give you another example, uh, the big accounting firms um, with their current cash balance plus their current bookings mm -hmm. in, their, in, their, in their consulting arms, not their audit arms cause, and some of their compliance arms because they do that every year. So yep. they actually have recurring revenue in that part of their business. Mm -hmm. Uh, in their consulting arms, they have three or four months payroll covered. That's it. We're talking about big, enormous global organisations mm. here. So for the people this, um, on this webinar who might be small business owners or work for smaller businesses who think the big companies have got it sorted, can I assure you they don't? Mm. Um, and this is a challenge for them too. Mm. Um, so let's talk about how Stella um, did this mm. uh, in recurring revenue. Um, and again, this is also an opportunity to communicate value um, and the fact that her customers are valued. And we'll get to a good example on that one in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, so what she did is she created a, a maintenance or support product. Mm. Um, and so it's a recurring, um, it's a recurring revenue product. So it's a, it's $1,000 a year on the small product yep. uh, for the small websites, 2000 for the mid and 3000 for the large. So she's done a slightly lower price on mm -hmm. the large and the, for her bigger customers, again, it's... She's passing on some of her uh, economies of scale to them. Yep. I value you. Yep. You know, so it's not just a percentage of the package price. Mm. Uh, for small and mid it is. For large, she's just brought it down just a just touch. Just a little bit. And again, that just sends a very powerful message. Um, on I, I'm going to pass on some of my va volume discounts to you. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what's included in this, uh, there is uh, the hosting. Mm -hmm. um, there is the content updates. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the new plugins. Um, if you use WordPress, for example, there's a billion new plugins every five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so Stella keeps on top of all that, yep. so you don't have to. Um, I'll, to give you an example where I heard this recently, now I work in the tech business, so mm -hmm. when I ask you uh, who does your hosting, I'm expecting to hear Google or Amazon or uh, Microsoft Azure yep. or, or whatever. She said to me a person's name. Mm. I was talking to this friend of mine um, who'd had a problem with her website. Her website had been hacked. Um, and it was all of a sudden covered in, well, adult images. Uh, which was a serious oh, problem for her brand because her brand yeah. was personal image branding. Yeah. yeah, major, major problem yeah. for her value proposition. And this poor woman was just having a complete meltdown. And so when I spoke to her, I asked her, who does your hosting? And I actually, the answer I got was a person that we both knew yep. who was already on it and was fixing it. And it was looking at how to make sure that this wouldn't happen again. Yeah. Um, and because of the maintenance um, product this lady had mm. with her uh, web designer, uh, was why she could get 
it turned around that Straight fast. Like that. And in that sort of situation, yeah, it, it's like mm. on it immediately. Um, and I don't know how much she valued that. So that comes down to this, right? Yeah. The value base part and her brand as well. So for that lady, she would rather work with a human being on those things yeah. without having to understand all that. Because for her, she just felt. Yeah. For her to even take her business online was a big step, Yeah. Uh, let alone dealing with all that stuff. And I, that does come down to that relationship between marketing and pricing as well. Yeah. And I know that even with our site as well, we have um, people manage it. But if mm. anything goes wrong or if I notice something's up, I know mm. I can email that person straight away and, like you said, talk to that person. Yeah. And this is what Stella's done because mm -hmm. she's actually created her brand around the fact that, you know what, you will have to pay for this, but you are going to have a real person at the yeah. end of the line. And it's almost the insurance policy yeah. in some respects. So, yeah, and so this, the, that recurring revenue allows Stella to communicate how much she values the relationship. Insurance is about certainty. Yeah. You know, someone's going to be there when it goes wrong. Um, and just the experience Stella has on actually dealing with mm. that issue. She knows immediately what to do. She doesn't feel overwhelmed by that, whereas this lady I know yeah. was just... Because once, once the overwhelm kicks in, your ability to cognitive... <laughs> Well, it's actually been proven the ability cognitively is the part of your brain that sits about here, mm. um, actually shuts down. Mm. So you actually can't solve it. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's it's actually working with people who, who will. So just on this, um, because I know there's a lot of people in Stella's, um, mm. in terms of her industry, yeah. a lot of people are doing this and a lot of people watching the webcast today as well will be thinking, I'm in an industry where commoditisation is oh, yeah. definitely a risk. And, Indeed. you know, for some people, they may throw it into the too hard basket. For other people, they might try and change up their pricing. Um, what can Stella do here to actually decrease that risk? I know you yeah, love decreasing risk. Well, I do. <laughs> yes, yes, that makes me very happy. Um, yeah, and I think the big thing around commoditization is let's use hosting as an example. Mm. The example I used before in the tech industry, when I ask who does your hosting, I'm expecting to yep. hear a tech company no. Um, because if you know what you're doing in, mm. in, in hosting, you can do it yourself. They've, they've set it up in such a way that um, you can just buy it as an off-the-shelf commoditized yep. product. Yep. Um, but not everyone wants to learn how to do that. Mm. Um, now, the day, by the way, will come when hosting will be an app on my phone. And in fact, there will be a virtual assistant who can actually figure it out for yeah. me. Absolutely, it's it's uh, for, for Stella this recurring revenue stream she's got that's called maintenance around maintenance and hosting won't last forever. Mm. What it does is gives her a bit of capacity to figure out how she adapts to changes in the market. She may, for example, be able to run classes to teach people how to mm. do this stuff. Um, that's just one example. But the other thing is it gives her time to figure out how she adapts and changes her business model that still very much gets to valuable relationships and certainty and all of those things. And it could be that just that product's not called mm. maintenance and hosting anymore. Yeah. She actually calls it something else. Yeah. Um, because a bit like for Hoyts, it's got nothing to do with the movie. It mm. is actually about the experience. Yeah. And this is actually where you truly get to learn what it is your customers value about you. And mm. so all of your messaging actually then goes around. That's, it's actually almost got nothing to do with the product yeah. in many respects. Uh, I don't know what the answer is for Stella in that regard um, in terms of where the industry is going to go. Mm -hmm. um, I would encourage her to continue what she's doing now and to be open and adaptable to different mm. ways of doing things. Um, and the other thing is her whole industry is going through this. Mm. Um, and so to be at the early... Early, there's a difference between trying to invent a new way of doing things that the market's not even aware of mm -hmm. yet versus being an early adopter yeah. and jumping it on it fairly quickly and early. Depends where you want to sit in that. And I think as long as she's aware of it, as long yeah. as you're aware that this is happening, then you mm -hmm. can put in things and you're not going to have that experience one day when you're just overwhelmed and you're just like, holy crap, when did What's, this happen? Yeah. <laughs> um, so before we get into, um, you're going to do a quick demonstration on mm -hmm. costs and how that all works within Stella's business. But first of all, um, people asked this um, when they were signing up for the uh, webcast mm -hmm. today and they want to turn the difference between discounting and rebates. Um, what that all means, what's the difference between mm -hmm. it, um, what should you be doing? Um, can you just elaborate a little further on that? Yeah, of course. Um, and again, this is in the messaging area. Um, just go back one. Yep. Um, so in terms of discounts and rebates, the reason this is a messaging thing is whilst the financial impact may be the yep. same, the message it sends to your market um, absolutely gets to um, brand value, um, whether you value your customers, whether your customers value you, mm -hmm. and obviously then with the knock-on effects to profitability, we'll, yep. we'll go through in a minute. Um, so whilst the maths might look the same, it actually, because it sends such different messages, mm. um, I always encourage people to use rebates rather than discounts. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example, um, a discount is, and a bricks and mortar retailer doing yep. this, everything's just on sale. 
Um, I have no loyalty to that store. Mm. Um, I'm walking along the street and go, oh, that looks pretty. And I go in and have a look and, of course, I get the sugar hit because it was a bargain and so mm. I've, I've saved all this money, really. Mm. Um, which is very addictive. Yeah. And I, there's a problem I used to have. But, um, yeah, it's there's no long-term loyalty in that. I'm mm. not going to come back to that shop. Um, another one was, um, oh, it was the, oh, what were they called? Things like Groupon yeah. um, and Spreets and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so people would sell coupons at a massive discount um, to try and get, as a marketing tool, to try and get people into their store or their shop yep. or whatever. And it just never worked because those customers never came back. Mm. Um, they got their one-off hit and, and they were never to See be ya. seen again. Mm. So discounting doesn't create loyalty mm. and repeat business. Uh, the point with rebates, um, and I, that works best um, on a volume basis. Mm -hmm. So what we talked about Hoyt's, the, the Hoyt's kiosks yep. before. When your cost of delivery is not huge, um, the more you sell of your product, the better. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you have a customer who's um, buying $10,000 a year with you versus $100,000 a year with you, uh, that $100,000 a year customer is, is going to be a lot more profitable yep. just based on sheer volume, uh, as, as long as you've got good systems set up. And, again, we'll get into mm -hmm. that in a moment. Um, the point is that then for your capacity to give a volume rebate to the $100,000 customer is fairly substantial. Mm -hmm. So it could be at the end of the year, um, there's a 30% rebate for them. And so your net revenue is actually 70,000. 70, yep. So the mass is the same as a 30% discount. But the point is they've actually already spent the money with mm. you. The money's moved. They have paid you $100,000, which means they value you. Yeah. You then send a $30,000 back the other way. And mm. I actually encourage people to move the money because mm. um, there's something about the money moving that actually communicates value. I don't know what it is, but I've seen it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so basically in that particular scenario, let's say there's a 30% rebate because they've spent $100,000 with you that year. Um, you're communicating the fact that they are very valuable mm -hmm. um, to you. You want to reward them for their loyalty. Um, and so their likelihood of spending $100,000 with you next year is much higher. Yeah. Um, and again, it's just all of those messaging that you mm. communicate, which then creates a very, very valuable and thus profitable customer for you. So can you start seeing how yeah. focusing on this spits out good finance results at but the would end? But you, do you just say, oh, by the way, guys, here's a 30 grand rebate? Like, what's your explanation? How do you...? So that's, and that's where you need some good thought processes because yeah. you communicate this at the beginning. Yeah. So when you're talking to a customer about how they're going to work with you, and in terms of, especially this is about creating the long-term relationship, yeah. so the multi-year engagement. Um, you have a program you show them, it's in the contract, yeah. um, that yeah. if you spend... So from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. up to this level. Because it's a, it's a good conversation to yeah. have. I'll give you an example of how I used to do it in my own business model um, as a consulting CFR. Mm -hmm. uh, I never, ever discount, um, and my price is reasonably high. Um, I'm managing other people's money in high-risk mm. situations, and the investors truly value that. Yeah. So what I do is I actually do a at-risk portion. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically I set a percentage of my fee I'll set aside. Mm -hmm. um, which you can then pay me on success at the end, which yeah. is normally around capital raising. If we raise more capital than you thought, then it doubles. So, it's, again, it's me communicating that this mm. is valuable. Yep. Um, I will do everything required, necessary, to make this capital raise happen for you. Um, and I'm also, I'm backing myself. Yeah. Um, so it's effectively deferred payment terms, yep. and it's a tool I use to then not discount. Perfect. Um, so it's, it's deferred payment terms rather than rebates. Mm. Um, but what it is, is it's sending the message that I back myself, I believe in myself, I believe in your business because mm -hmm. I'm taking a risk on your and I'll business. I'll make it happen. I'll make it happen. Um, and I'm, I'm aligned to you. Yep. You know, I will do everything necessary for you to be successful. Yep. Um, and I find that sends a very powerful message. Okay, so what I want to do now, that mm -hmm. is very powerful, by the way, um, <laughs> we're at the end now, so um, I want you to do a live demonstration. Da, 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 da. Sure. <laughs> well, let, um, let me pull across one I prepared earlier. Yes, exactly. So. It's been uh, baking in the oven for it, it has. <laughs> a few hours now. Um, so what we're going to go through here is, um, you know, there's some questions that Stella that mm -hmm. we might be asking here in terms of cost and stuff like that. Um, and everyone, might I add, that you can also find a copy of the spreadsheet that mm -hmm. Rachel's going to go through now in the resource library, and that's yours to keep. Yep. And we'll send that out in the recording email if you do complete the survey. That would be great. We'll send that out to you, and that's something you can use for your own business. So let's go through this. What's it all about, and how, to, how can we actually use this to help ourselves in business? Sure. Um, so, Sarah, these questions which are on the screen now, 
actually get to um, how pr pricing impacts your profitability. Yeah. The questions you need to ask yourself to understand that. Now, some of this is then gets into the systems you have around delivery, yep. which is a whole other topic mm -hmm. um, as such, but is helpful to be aware of because if you've done value-based pricing, um, you do need to focus on these systems. And again, I'll point people to their mentors around yep. this in terms of how they deliver. Perfect. Um, but because that also has a massive impact on profitability. It also says if you've invested in that stuff, again, you value the fact that you'll do a good job yeah. for your clients. So that's that's why some of that stuff's relevant. It also, it just has a, an, an, a fairly substantial impact on the maths. Yeah. Um, so it's just important to keep in mind. And I know everyone loves maths. So Sarah, I'm, Sarah I know you're not, not so fond of maths, so I'm going to ask I'm you a question. I'm getting better. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question here. What does two plus two equal? Four. You have enough maths to do this. Yep. Okay, done. I'll... Let's get into it. Absolutely. I'm excited now. So, um, if we just bring the, uh, the spreadsheet up. Yep. Um, so, so th what you should see on screen at the moment um, is the pricing template Stella used to use yep. um, to quote on number of hours mm -hmm. uh, and to create a, a quote for every job. So, at the moment, she has three people. Um, and so that's the number of staff there. Uh, and that costs her in salaries. Uh, so salaries, not super and all the rest of it, but the salaries are around $20,000 a month. Yep. Um, in terms of the cost rate per hour that creates, uh, I'm just going to bring up the formula on screen here. Um, so basically we take the monthly staff cost of $20,000 um, and we divide that by the number of hours. Mm -hmm. um, how we figure that out is 40 hours a week times three people mm -hmm. um, times four points. There's 4.3 weeks in a month. Yep. Uh, the, the, the month thing gets a bit funky because it's not four weeks, it's mm. 4.3, and I've seen that catch more people out than I care to remember. Uh, so that gives a cost rate to her business for mm -hmm. having those three people on staff. Um, Stella's heard about the rule of thirds. Yep. Um, and the rule of thirds is used in the legal profession and the accounting profession as well, uh, but it's something a lot of web developers are taught to use the rule of thirds in their pricing. What that means is you take the salary cost of your staff and times it by three mm -hmm. to come up with a charge out rate. Now, obviously, it comes up with a number of $116.28. Now, if you use, getting back to messaging, $116.28, your customers <laughs> will look at you like you have three heads. Oh, yes. Uh, so generally what's done, and I've just left um, that formula in there, so there's just one less step in this, yep. but generally, you know, you'd round that up to 120. Yeah. Um, so what she then does is she has, a, uh, she has a proposal on the table. She believes it's going to take around 70 hours to deliver that mm -hmm. engagement. And so, again, that's what I was saying before. From her viewpoint, the maths is fairly simple. Once she knows it's 70 hours, she times that by the charge out rate of 116, okay. and she's got the price. And again, it's just an odd number. Yeah. Um, and in terms of what that, can you see how some of these odd numbers, just mm. what it communicates to your clients? Um, now, by the way, she had figured that out. So it was $120 an, um, an hour, and that would come up with like 8000 250 or something. Got it. Um, again, just it's a round number. It just okay. looks more sensible. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, when she changed her pricing model from quoting based on hours to packaging. Mm -hmm. So what you need to look at here is actually volume. And I tend to find in a services-based business, because the thing is with her medium and large projects, she doesn't deliver them all inside a month. Mm. So the best way to do that, and again, this is very specific to her business yep. model, is to look at an average over a three-month period because all of that stuff just evens out. So what we look at here is, so we've got a package pricing here of 5000 10000 and 20000 Yep. And so how many of those does she deliver? Yep. Now, Stella used to, a couple of years ago, she changed her business model to focus more on the larger projects because mm -hmm. she thought, that, you know, there'd be gold in them, their hills. Um, it actually um, created major problems for her profitability because mm -hmm. of the systems issues and the expectations that her clients had and her ability to service that. Yep. So she's actually now gone back to predominantly smaller projects mm -hmm. with the recurring revenue. With more of them. Uh, and with more of them. And that's working a lot better for her. And again, that's taken experimentation. Uh, whereas for another web developer, it actually might be a different mix, um, yep. which we'll get to in a moment. Let me just walk through the maths first and then I can show you how th you can actually use this to see how things change. Uh, so the revenue from that over a three-month period um, is $170,000. Uh, so the average price per project is just literally the revenue divided by number of projects. Mm -hmm. um, so she can sort of see where she's sitting, and that's a good trend metric. 
Um, and then the average hours per project. So there's a certain number of hours available over a three month period in her team. Okay. And so it's sitting at around 50 hours a project. And so she knows that it's making yeah. sense. Um, remember, in this model, we've lost the nexus between specific hours on specific project and yep. price. So these metrics help her keep an eye on that stuff uh, to make sure her overall business model is working. Um, a lot of web designers have very specific project management systems where you actually track your hours mm. per project, and I would encourage them to continue to use that because that's actually your way of making sure that these metrics stack up and make sense. Yep. Um, but they don't; they then no longer form your basis for pricing. Mm. Um, yeah, so obviously this all then gets into capacity, which we'll talk about on the next page. Um, by the way, before you start any marketing or, or pricing, pack capacity is, is actually thing. the precursor step. Yeah. Um, but that's a, a whole topic for another day. Um, so her average revenue per month is 56667 mm -hmm. over those just 170000 divided by three. Let's say she keeps her package pricing the same, but she changes the mix. So she only does 12 of those. She does nine of those, sorry, let's keep that at six, and she does three larger ones. Um, you can see how things move around a little bit. Um, obviously, the amount of hours spent per project um, has gone up mm -hmm. from about 50 to around 60. Um, her average price per project has actually gone up to similar to that quoted price before. Um, and so this probably gets into where she was trying to, she was trying to go up the value chain a bit. Mm. Um, and so this, this, you can see how this actually changes the mix quite yeah. substantially, whereas the actual... The revenue, the total revenues moved from 170 to 180, so it hasn't shifted a lot. A lot, but, considering she's doing extra pro, large projects. Yeah, but it's also, it has changed the dynamics of how her internal systems work quite dramatically. Okay. So it's just, again, these sort of tools just help you do the what if planning. And again, you do this with your mentors. Um, and the numbers are a guide for you, uh, the decision sits with you. Um, they're to help you make decisions, they're not, they don't make the decision for you. Yeah. So let's get into, obviously, the final magic number around profitability. Mm. Um, so this compares the two scenarios for Stella. Um, so in the first scenario where it was hours, uh, hour base quotes, um, uh, there, was, there was 516 hours available per month in mm -hmm. her three staff. Um, generally speaking, people don't work at 100% capacity. 80% is pretty good. Yep. Uh, that's about as good as it gets. So there's 413 hours available yeah, yeah. as billable in a month. People go on holidays, people get sick. Yep. Um, you do actually need to let people go to the bathroom occasionally, um, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, and so that creates the estimated revenue uh, per month, which is just literally, uh, for her, is 413 hours times that hourly rate. Got it. Um, so that's effectively her capacity. That, that's her maximum revenue she mm -hmm. can bill a month in that model. Can you see how... It's all coming packaging, together. In the packaging model, it goes up. Mm. So let's talk about the other costs. Um, so her direct staff costs, so that's the three people, 20000 a month. Yeah. Again, this is I tend to find per month is the yeah. best way to look at this. Yeah. Um, and it's if you need to look at, so for example, some of these other cost lines, you average them over three months yeah. and then divide that by three to get an average get monthly cost. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it just needs to help you make decisions. Uh, so, so this is where 80% is good enough. 80% accurate is good enough. Mm. Uh, so her other direct staff costs, and remember this is only salaries. Um, the other staff costs, this is the, um, the on costs on salary. So this is your superannuation, your payrolls tax, and your All workers' comp, and your staff training. You know how much I talk about that stuff. Um, there is, sorry, that's the, that's down here. So that's the staff on costs, um, the superannuation, sorry. And I've then your fixed costs. Got the line, yeah. Fixed costs is things like the rent and mm. uh, insurance bills and just the stuff of keeping the lights on. These other staff costs, are excluding Stella, are her indirect costs. Yep. She has a, a marketing admin um, and she's got some other people as well. Um, and so that's, that's what that cost is. Mm. Um, so in the first scenario, her net profit, uh, and this, this becomes her income from the business. So she may draw this as a mm -hmm. salary. She may take it as owner's drawings. If she had an, a sole trader, she would um, pay dividends. She needs to talk to her accountant about what the right method is. Um, but this then becomes her net profit for the month, which then becomes her income. And that's obviously increased a lot more with the yeah. packaging side of things, which is great. It is. Yes. It is. So this, this is um, a great spreadsheet, I think, for anyone to mm. download from the resource library and take a look at. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I think even just seeing that difference in one mm. little change, how yeah. it could impact someone's overall profitability, I think and that's... And I haven't even put the recurring stuff in here Exactly. Yet. This is just All to the keep it simple. and everything. Yeah, this is just um, purely on, on, on projects. Yeah, yeah. so um, thank you.
Oh, That's been great. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today. And like I said, please complete the feedback survey. We'll then send you a copy of the recording within 48 hours, as well as a copy of the spreadsheet if you haven't had a chance to download it. Um, thank you. Very enlightening today. Um, good to understand how it all sort of comes together and how pricing does take over a whole company um, and how everyone sort of needs to be aware of what they're doing all the way from the beginning all the way down to the end. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time.